So yeah, today we are talking about this 2U server, which I use for my crypto. It does all my wallets. And if you see these four lights blinking right here, these are four flux fractus nodes. They're not doing any compute work. It's just hard drive storage basically. And they blink every once in a while, but they're still in beta. So these really don't have that much data and they're not being utilized that much. So basically this computer, is sitting at idle at 160. It bounces a little bit as you saw right there, but on average 155 to 160 watts, maybe 165. That's the idle. Now inside this computer, I have dual CPUs, 2690 V2 Xeons and 256 gigs of RAM. Massive overkill for what I'm doing with this. So we wanna get the power down. And the way we're gonna try that today, I spec'd out one of my older CPU miners right here. This is an MSI, what is it? B450A Pro Max motherboard. This has a 3950X in there. I got a Dynatron, I think this is the A25 or A24. I'll leave a link for this cooler in the video description. This is made directly for fitting in a 2U chassis. I put 128 gigs of 3200 megahertz RAM, cheaper RAM. Um, I have one card uh, add in NVMe that's going to go in the first 16x slot. And the second one is a SAS HBA because as you see in a minute, once I open this up and we start swapping on out, this has an HBA for all these 12 bays built onto the motherboard. So I'm hoping once I'm done this switch over and we got this in here running and got Unraid reconfigured to use the cores that are available on the 3950X, hopefully we should be sitting more around 80 watts because like I said, this is overkill for what I'm doing right now. So let's shut this unit off, get it open and show you the guts of it and then rip out its guts. So now with the server off, we can take a look inside. I was showing you before, I have two 2690 V2 CPUs in here, a total of 256 gigs of DDR3. And here's that other card I was talking about. This is a 3.2 gigabyte Samsung NVMe add-in card. This is gonna be transferred over to the new uh, 3950X. And if we look over here, you can see it has a built-on HBA. So we're gonna to have to disconnect these SAS cables and connect them to the HBA that's gonna be over here. So let's get this ripped out of here. Now that we have it open, first we need to pop out the IO shield because we're not gonna need that anymore. And this is why I like using super micro chassis because they usually tend to stick more with the standard ATX form factor and we can use them directly in here. So with everything out, let's put in our replacement board. Now, as you saw, I had to readjust all the little mounting points to switch it from that EATX form factor just to this regular ATX form factor. So let's screw it down. So I had to remove this center plate because it felt like the back of the heatsink mount was hitting it and flexing the board. And I didn't want it to short out. This is probably not needed when we switch over to a regular ATX. We're not gonna be using the second EPS 12 volt since we only have a single CPU. And this is an I squared C connector that reads information from the power supplies that will not be used in this build. So we will zip tie these out of the way. Okay, so we have the wires for the three 80 millimeter case fans. Let's get these wired up. And finally, we have our SAS HBA cables that we need to connect. 
Okay, let me get some zip ties and let's clean up this mess. Now for Unraid, I had a USB boot drive and also just a dummy 16 gigabyte drive I was using for the array because I don't really use the array in Unraid. So I had that going to an internal USB 2.0 port that was on the Super Micro motherboard. Consumer boards don't usually have that. They have the USB 2.0 headers. So I'm gonna adapt it with one of these nice little things that take a USB 2.0 header and give you two ports. And this way I can just lay that down right in there and I got my boot drives. Now there's one other thing we do need to connect. It's actually up here. For the front panel switches on a Super Micro motherboard. For the front panel switches that are on the front of this case, we need this adapter cable to go from their little 16 pin ribbon cable that's sitting right here to regular two pin. And I can put in the hard drive, LEDs, the power switch, the reset switch. So let me do that. Let's give this thing some power and see if it powers on. Now I pre-set up this motherboard for the RAM timings. The CPU is set for base clock only, no PBO. So we're just gonna run around like 3.6 gigahertz, I believe, or 3.5 base clock. Uh, this has already been set up. Latest BIOS flashed on it and power on when power fail is turned on. So as soon as I plug this power in, it should power itself on. There we go, it's turning on. It's running those fans a little high right now because I don't have a program. Oh wait, okay. It is cooling back down. I have not connected a network connection. So good, it powers on. Let's put the case on, put it back in here so I can connect the network cable. Okay, so I got it back up and running. It is on the Ryzen motherboard, and we are now pulling a steady state idle here of about 128 watts. Not as low as I would have liked to get it, but I saved 30 watts from the machine itself and got a ton of more compute power versus having the dual Xeon. Let's switch over to the desktop. So almost three days later, Two days 22 hours 53 minutes it's been running perfectly fine not a single hiccup whatsoever so let's go over the pros and cons of this switchover because this is not for everyone uh, one of the things i am going to miss but not enough that really matters is ipmi the server is literally right on the other side of this room so i really don't need remote access like if it was sitting in a data center or a remote location so having not having ipmi is not a big deal now for me also we are missing eight threads from the old system but the difference in speed wow let me show you so on cpubenchmark.com i got pulled up here uh the ryzen 9 3950x which is what is in there now and i had two so take whatever number is in this row and double it i had two 2690 v2s Turbo speed, we're not worried about because even on the 2690 V2s, I had turbo disabled. On the Ryzen 9 3950X, I don't have PBO turned on. It's running at 3.5 gigahertz, the base clock speed. That's all it does. Same with the 2690. It was only running 3 gigahertz. So this is where I was hoping I would save more wattage, uh, especially at idle. But apparently, I've only saved, what, about 30 watts? Um, the TDP on the Ryzen 9 is only 105 watts. The 2690V2, each CPU is 130 watts, equaling 260. Uh, so when we push the chips, I probably save some money. But at idle, it didn't really save that much. Now, here's where the rubber meets the road. For single thread rating, 1889 on this 2690V2. That doesn't matter if I have one or two. Each single thread, that's its speed rating. S single speed rating for the... Ryzen 9 3950X, 2709. That's a 30% increase from what I had before on a single threaded application. Now, multi threaded 3950X gets 38,926. Take this number and double it. So, 13,5, we're talking about 27,000 roughly. Um, yeah, 
38 actually 39,000 beats 27,000 a whole ton so even though I have less threads I have more overall compute power now remember I made this out of a lot of stuff I had sitting around so it really did not cost me a lot to do this upgrade um if you had to buy this stuff all outright you might want to look into the used first gen epic cpu combos that you can get out of china now you can literally get a first gen epic the h11 super micro board um and probably 64 128 gigs of ddr4 memory ecc memory for five or six hundred dollars right now so it depends upon what your use case is i didn't care to go for epic because i did not need all the multitude of pcie lanes for my use case if you're doing a lot with pcie lanes you might be better off going with uh, AMD Epic. And as you can see, right now, the only thing I have running is my four Flux nodes, the uh, Thunder nodes or Fractus nodes. One, two, three, and four. And they're just idling. They're not doing any compute power. They're, they don't by design because they're still in beta. Flux isn't really using them yet. And you can see I have 128 gigs of DDR4, non-ECC. Honestly, for my use case, I'm not really worried about having ECC memory. I, I back up my VMs once a week, so if there's really a weird cosmic particle that flips a bit in my memory, uh, it's not the end of the world. I'll just restore from a backup. It's not, my work is not mission critical. And now that 128 gigabytes, I'm only using 30%. So I got plenty of space. And even if I go up here, if I look at the CPU pinning, you can see flux node one, two, three, and four. Each one has its dedicated two core four threads. So that part of the CPU is all dedicated just to flux. Then I can spread out all the rest of this over the rest of the VMs if they're even running. Like none of these VMs are running right now, but I can share the other half of that chip basically with whatever I want. So I've got more than enough computing power. And I've actually tuned the fans a little bit more through Unraid. I got the fans literally this one is the cpu the one that's running 4200 you can barely hear it right now uh the three case fans 2300 no problems whatsoever and if i go and check the temperatures on the hard drives right on over here um this is that 3.2 terabyte 109 degrees fahrenheit no big deal the four spinners if i bring the fans up a little bit i'll get it down to 88 degrees fahrenheit but 90 is perfectly fine for a spinner you're not going to have any heat related issues because they're running 24 7. And just keep in mind, at the time of making this video, they've already got Unraid 6.12 out. Uh, actually, a couple newer revisions of 6.12. They've done a few bug fixes. I'm still running 6.11.4, and I have zero issues with running a 3950X for an Unraid server. If you made it all the way to the end, thank you for watching all the way through, and you didn't fall asleep. Thumbs up, please, and I will catch you next video.